Hi, I'm Guy Massey, Horticultural Extension Agent for Virginia Cooperative Extension in Stafford, Virginia. And this is the third in a series of uh, instructional videos that we're doing uh, pertaining to all things gardening, horticulture, or entomology for that matter. Today is a real special subject that I really enjoy. It's, it's near and dear to me. We're going to be talking about tropical plants, but not just tropical plants in the normal situation. We want to, we're going to try, uh, talk to you about growing tropical plants here in Virginia. Cre in other words, creating a tropical paradise in Virginia. Can it really be done? Okay. Well, there's a couple of things you need to consider first, and I just want to, you to understand before I get into the whole pro, uh, uh, process of growing tropical plants, is that you really need to uh, think outside the box. Uh, look at things that the literature says you can't grow, because you may be able to grow it if you take uh, a, a particular um, precautions. Thank you. Okay. Um, don't be afraid to try something new. Now, I will uh, uh, add to this that if you're one of those that just likes to plant and forget about it, this is not the subject for you. You're dealing with tropical plants in a relatively cold environment, so they will take a little bit of work. These are not uh, plants that you can just forget about, and you will have to do a little bit of work with them. All right. And the other uh, uh, caveat I want to say is that these are not uh, native to Virginia. Uh, however, they are not invasive, and they are not listed in the uh, uh, Virginia Native Plant Society's native uh, plant list. Okay, a uh, couple things you also you need to know about before you get started is plant location. Make sure they're in a good location, that they have good drainage, and the microclimate is absolutely essential. What do I mean by microclimate? I'm talking about the area, the immediate area that you haven't planted in. For instance, if you plant them in your front yard or in a north facing area uh, where it gets the cold winter winds and are not protective, that microclimate would not be conducive. If you have a fenced in area in the backyard or an area that is south facing and uh, keeps back the cold winds, uh, that would be, or, or next to a hardscape like a house or a pool or something where it would stay warmer. Um, that would be a nice microclimate. So you really need to place these uh, uh, in certain situations. Choose your site uh, critically. And then, of course, they're going to need a lot of organic matter as well, but don't create planting pockets. In other words, if you're planting in really poor soil and you dig your hole and you just fill it with organic matter and some soil, uh, that's not good either because it's, it's going to create a planting pocket and the, the, the uh, roots will not want to go beyond that. Okay, a couple other considerations. Uh, if you are going to order them online, your plants, make sure you do that in the spring. Get them in the spring so they have all summer to get established uh, before the winter. Uh, fertilize them in the spring as well to help them get established. Uh, water as needed then, and let the plant tell you that. I can't give you a, a, a prescription on when to water, how much to water. But uh, check the soil. Use your finger. Get down in there and check the soil. If it's dry, then you're going to need to water it. Okay. Uh, most of these plants, though, once they're established, uh, can take somewhat drought conditions, except for tropical bananas. Uh, you might have to. Uh, they are pr pretty much heavy uh, uh, feeders, and they like lots of water. So you know you might have to be check them pretty regularly. I have to water mine in the heat of the summer once or twice a day, okay? Um, so plant choice, let's talk about what's out there. Uh, there are uh, tropical plants that are rated for our hardiness zone in Fredericksburg, which is zone 7A. However, as I said before, if you're a lazy gardener like I am usually, uh, you don't want to try these because they might need a little bit of extra protection. Less hardy uh, species can survive here, but again, it's going to need more work. And also, if you're purchasing plants, try to get them in containers rather than uh, field grown because you're, they'll be less uh, traumatized, the roots will be less traumatized, and they should be able to establish a little bit quicker. All right, the next slide here shows our zone map, and I just want to talk a little bit about the hardiness zone. This is the USDA uh, Virginia Climate Zone Map uh, dealing with hardiness, and we are in 7A, as you can see 
uh, that is sort of a, a lilac color um, there. And what that tells you is that uh, the average annual minimum temperature in that area, which is what we are, is zero to five degrees, okay? Average. Now, that's a loaded term, average, because at any given year, it could be much colder or much warmer. But over a period of years, it's not going to get any lower than zero to five degrees. That's the criteria you're using. Um, I stretch that a little bit. If I know it's going to get really cold, I will take extra steps to try and uh, mitigate that and cover the plants or do something to get them through those real cold temperatures. And of course, we have many years here in uh, Fredericksburg area in Virginia where we don't even get down into the teens. Last year was a mild winter, and if you had tropical plants, they would have just loved it and gotten through that this last winter. But usually speaking, you're going to get maybe nine, ten years of, of decent weather, and then that tenth year or so, you're going to get really cold temperatures, and you will have to do something if you want to save your plants. That really, that's what happened to me with my um, uh, Chinese windmill palm, which I'll talk about in a little bit. A couple other terms I just want to talk about: cold sensitive versus cold, or chilling sensitive versus chilling tolerant plants. Um, chilling sensitive are uh, severely injured um, in, by long-term exposure to temperatures. Oh, that's actually chilling uh, tolerant. Chilling sensitive are killed within four hours of, of cold temperatures. And that's not freezing temperatures. Cold hardy can take freezing temperatures if they're called cold hardy and they'll tolerate extensive periods of freezing. Cold sensitive plants are injured by ice crystals forming in intercellular spaces. And don't forget acclimatization. Uh, we talked about that in the last video where you need to slowly acclimatize it to the conditions that you're going to give it. Okay, now that we discussed some of the needs and some of the things that you're going to have to do with these water plants, let's talk about some of the plants that are out there. Uh, there are hardy palms, and of course, I always like to teach our teacher master gardeners, palms are not trees, so I won't call them trees. They're more closely related to the grasses, and it's good to know when we get into the winter and how hardy they are uh, dealing with their crown and whether they're going to get through or not. But uh, these next, uh, uh, in this next slide, you see I've listed some palms that uh, are considered hardy. They do not normally need winter protect, uh, protection. Uh, if you see the needle palm, rap Rapidophyllum uh, hystrix is a fan type clumping palm. Uh, not a big one, but uh, it is somewhat cold hardy. It's considered one of the most cold hardy in the world uh, in zone 6B. Now we're 6A. So 6B uh, is a little bit colder than us, and it will survive down to zero degrees. So that's a good one to start with. Uh, that probably will not need a whole lot of uh, attention. Okay, these are just some pictures of it. It's a beautiful uh, a needle palm. Okay, the Chinese windmill palm, Trichocarpus fortunii, I actually grew in my backyard for about 10, 11 years. It was doing quite well. Uh, this has a, a palm that has a nice trunk to it, will get tall, 10 to 20 feet. Um, best of probably adapted in Virginia. Uh, um, it's in zone 7B, so that's the zone we're in. Now, as I always tell Master Gardeners, the plants don't always read the literature, so they don't always know they're in 7B. And when we get a real cold year, it could take them out. When I was growing mine, I had, like I said, I had for about 10 years, it was uh, getting up about 5 feet beautiful plant. It got through snowmageddon, if you remember that, a few years ago, uh, with the fronds were just completely covered with snow, did not hurt it at all. And then a few years after that, we got a really cold snap with no snow cover and no protection. Uh, we got down into around zero degrees uh, for a few days, and that pretty much took it out. Now, one thing about these palms, since they are like grasses, as I said before, they have a, a growing point is, is within the crown itself, like a grass would be, okay? So the, the, the reason you need to know that is the fronds themselves may, may freeze out and may turn brown. But as long as that growing point within the crown, uh, within the trunk there, and sometimes it'd be up by it being protected in the trunk, it'll get through colder temperatures, it will come out with new fronds the next year. So just because the plant, we got a really cold snap and, uh, and your, your um, tricky carpus or Chinese woodmill palm lost some fronds, it turned brown, uh, you need to cut them off in the spring, 
certainly, uh, you just wait, have, have some patience. Uh, the one year, all the fronts uh, let, uh, died on me. I cut them back in the spring. I waited till about, let's see, uh, May. And then I saw a little green spot coming out of the middle, and it grew, and it did not die. The year it did die, though, it took that crown out, or that, that growing point out, and I could not uh, save it. Had I covered it, or I took some uh, uh, issues, or did some things to mitigate that cold time, uh, it probably would have gotten through it, okay? Nice, nice plant, does grow in uh, Spotsylvania most years. There are some not more pictures of it. You can see the one picture um, has uh, some snow on it, and the one on the right is actually in my yard. And you can see in the background, there is a pool in the yards, and that helps with keeping the, the and it's fenced in, so that's a very nice microclimate for tropical plants. In the hardscape around the house, and the water takes a while to cool off, uh, we'll keep it warm there through most of the winter, at least warm enough, okay? Another palm is the dwarf palmetto palm, uh, which is uh, a sable minor. Uh, this is a small fan palm. Uh, you really doesn't get a trunk to it, but it's good for zone 8 to 7B, so it may need some more protection than the uh, Chinese windmill palm uh, or the needle palm that I discussed earlier. It's another beautiful palm. These palms, I, I did uh, list these, uh, but take it with a grain of salt. They may need some winter protection. They probably will need winter protection. They are somewhat cold hardy, all right, and they will get through most of our winters. So if you just want to get four or five years of a, of a nice and figure you're going to replace it, these might work out, okay? The European fan palm is a nice one. That's the zone eight, all right? And zone eight is minus, or I mean five to 10 degrees. So if we get winters, and we get many winters sometimes, it doesn't get down to 10 degrees, barely gets in the teens, they should get through those winters quite well. If it does get cold, you should be prepared to do something to protect them from the extreme cold. Sometimes that just means draping some plastic over them, depending on how cold it gets and whether it's a frost or a real cold night, okay? Um, there's some pictures of it. The Chinese uh, fan palm, not the windmill palm, okay? The fan palm uh, is a single stem, stem fan palm. It could get up 15 to 20 feet. Again, it's zone 8, uh, so you might get some winter damage. Now, a lot of these plants, and I'll talk a little more about it when I get to my last one, which is my favorite plant, uh, and it's not a palm, is that they, they are, uh, the hardiness is in the root system and not always in the top. So a lot of these will come back uh, from uh, freezing temperatures. And then the pindo palm, uh, the butea capitata. Now, I actually tried to grow in that one year. I got in the spring, and it wasn't the hardiness that killed it or the cold that killed it. it I killed it with a little bit too much TLC in the summer, and it never really got into the winter. I'm going to try it again. It's really nice. It's one of the only hardy palms that has that pinnate like uh, frond rather than the palmate like the windmill palms. Uh, it's a beautiful palm, and I'd really like to try to get it to grow here in Virginia. Okay, another gorgeous picture of it. And then the, finally the sable palm, uh, shorter than the sable minor. And it's zone 7A to 8, so it's just a little bit uh, less cold hardy than the other uh, palms that I discussed. All right, so that, that's about all I'm going to say about palms. But there are other tropical plants that you can grow and uh, really have success with. And one of my favorite is, of course, banana. You can actually grow bananas. Uh, you can't grow bananas themselves, the fruit, but you can certainly grow the plants here in Virginia. And I'm going to show you some great pictures of, of a, a banana uh, plant that I have in my backyard. Now, I understand in Virginia, they're grown for the foliage. You're not going to get bananas from them. It just isn't long enough of a growing season. But you can certainly overwinter them uh, and for the foliage, and they will come back every year beautifully. If you, uh, even if you don't do anything, you, they will come back. Okay, but uh, the, the bananas, uh, when I was in Florida, I had a little banana plant I planted. 18 months later, I had the most delicious bananas off of it. This up here, the plant that I grew, uh, the variety, I actually, one year, I started, I got a flower, a banana a plant flower on it, a large two-foot flower, uh, the very cylindrical, the uh, burgundy, 
petals were very waxy thick. They rolled back and then there was the spathe with the banana starting to develop. That was in September. Uh, they started growing by October. We got a good freeze and that was the end of my bananas. But that was a little bit unusual for me to do that. So uh, as you can see on this slide, this was this is the banana plant I have growing in my backyard. I've had it going for probably about uh, probably about 12, 13 years now. Um, and it comes up every year uh, like that, okay? You do have to do some overwintering if you want to get that big. But it adds a lot of uh, tropical look to the backyard with those large leaves. Those leaves will be a good six feet uh, or more in size. So they're very exotic looking, very tropical looking. Now, here's what I normally would do when I first got that plant. Uh, I would let the, uh, let me show you a couple of slides here. You see how the, uh, the, the one picture showing the, the, front, the leaves all kind of dangling down and straight down? That's after a hard frost, okay? I would usually wait for that. Uh, and this, for the years of these, this picture is in the middle of the uh, winter, uh, I just let it die back. And I just let it lay on top of the... Uh, the uh, stock, the stock and everything would die back. The the stem, pseudo stem, would die back down to the ground and would just lay there. And that actually added some protection to the roots, um, at, like that. And I would just in the spring, when it started warming up, usually in March, I would uh, cut that off, the dead foliage and the dead pseudo stem off, and the babies would start coming up and looking beautiful. Okay, and that's all you really need to do for this particular type of palm. I'll, I'll uh, mention that in a minute. But this is a hardy palm, and it will uh, be able to uh, get through most of our winters, even if you don't do anything, as long as it's healthy. But the problem with that is, and this really isn't a problem, is when you let it come up new every year from the ground, it's going to get to about this size. You can see it's somewhat smaller, let me show you, than that. Okay, same, same plant. And this was probably taken uh, sometime in June. Uh, it will get a little bit bigger than that. Uh, June or July, uh, but it's, you know, and it will come back every year like that if you do nothing. Still a nice looking banana plant with uh, the, the um, very exotic look to it, okay? So, most years, uh, before I start doing something else I'll get to in a minute, uh, I just let the frost hit it and let it die back, and it would. Some years I would cut the fronds off, but if I wasn't going to do anything with it, and just let it go over the winter. I just leave everything on, let it fall down on top of itself and dry up like I showed you in that other picture and it would come back every year. All right. So I got to thinking about this and I talked to a guy who was growing these bananas, uh, banana plants up in the Quiet Harbor in Stafford and he was getting them through the winters and they were a lot bigger than mine. And I asked him what he was doing. And he says what he does is he goes down, a, he cuts it off before the first hard frost, so sometime in late September, October, uh, uh, you get a machete. I have a machete. I just cut the whole stem and everything off about three feet from the ground. So it's just a stalk. As you can see in the one picture, I have the box already built around it. So uh, it does take a little more work, but it really is rewarding if you take the time. There are two large stalks there I cut off, and you can even see some of the babies I just left on there. Uh, what I do is I, I go to the... Uh, the, the Home Depot or Lowe's, get a 4 by 8 sheet of plyboard, cut it in four pieces so that they are two feet by four feet tall. So you want at least a good foot above the, uh, the stump that you cut off of the banana, all right? And I build a box around them. I painted it that forest green so it isn't conspicuous outside. And there's what you can see what I ended up with. I filled up with leaves in the, in the fall. Leaves are falling, uh, so I um, uh, fill it up with the leaves. Uh, they, and, but you want to keep them dry. It makes a good insulation uh, and you can see the box there in the one picture. Now I do uh, take a, a, a plastic bag and I staple it over the top. There is a wooden piece over the top to keep any heavy snow from going down into it uh, and then I cover it with plastic and that's to keep it dry because those leaves are, have only good insulating uh, capacity uh, or ability when they're dry. If they get wet, it doesn't. So I just staple a plastic bag on and leave it all winter. Then I uh, usually, and I'm usually uh, ahead of things because I'm so anxious to get out there and see how it's doing. I start taking it off. Actually, the other picture you can see there with the top off and the leaves there, and you can actually see a leaf starting to come up through. I just did that this past, uh, let's see, about three weeks ago. Okay, 
in March actually, late late March, I went through and I took the, the top off and there it is, it's already starting to push up through that. Okay, you can see what happened after that, the next few pictures. Yeah, there's my daughter's dog in there, Lazarus. Lazzy, he's not tropical though, believe me, he's a beautiful Malamar. But anyways, um, you can see the, uh, I took two sides off, I took a picture of it, you can see the leaves uh, in there, and you can actually see the, the uh, leaves starting to come up through, uh, growing even through the winter, okay? Uh, so again, this was just a few weeks ago, I took it apart, you can see it already starting to grow, and you can see in the next slide, that uh, heavy brown area was where I cut it last fall. And you can see that white growth that came up through there, that was this winter. And then the new leaves actually started to grow up through that uh, even before that. This was taken a few days after I took it off and they're already starting to green up and starting to grow. Uh, if you do this, if you uh, take the time to box it up, okay, you're gonna end up with something like that by July. Again, it's, you get a jump on it um, in the summer and you'll have a nice large banana plant. Uh, and again, I've had this thing growing, what did I say, 15 years, 12, 13, 14, I don't know, I lose track of it. But it's been a while, we've been through cold weather with this. Uh, and even if I didn't box it up, it would come through. It just wouldn't get as big at the end of the summer like it uh, is here, okay? One other way that I usually do in the fall before I box it up and cut it back, well actually I'll cut everything back, there are always babies that come up and they start growing alongside it throughout the growing season. Some will be at various stages of growth. But the little ones, what I'll do is, just to make sure I have something to get through the winter, I will actually dig down around that. This little one you can see in the pot here, I potted it up. Uh, it's not doing so well. Well the problem is with these, is that the pseudostem is stuck to the mama plant and there's no roots or maybe one root under the ground. So I take a soil knife, I dig down a little bit, no more than a few inches, and I actually sever, cut that banana uh, baby away from the mother, and I put it in a pot. Now if I do that with six of them, I may get three that get through the winter and will grow roots. Many times they will just die because they don't have a, a root system enough to take care of them. This one wanted to die, it has, I won't let it. I keep watering it, it is still green, and, and I'm hoping that within a few weeks it's going to start putting out new plants. And now I have a new plant I can either give to a friend or I can put it in another part of the yard. So I will try to overwinter sometimes. I call them the babies or the little bananas that come up. Now, to understand a little bit about a banana plant, uh, if it were growing in, in the tropics where it uh, normally grows, it will take about 18 months to mature and flower and produce bananas. Then it's, it dies. It does not continue to grow. That mama plant that produced those bananas will, be get, will, will die back and the babies take over. So you're going to get the, even though it, it doesn't get to fruit uh, up here, the babies will continue to start to come off at the base and you can try and save them throughout the winter. And if you, you are successful, you have some really nice plants that you can plant in the ground or give away. Okay? Uh, this, is the, this is the variety that I use. This is the variety that you saw on the slides. It's called Musa Baju or Baju Banana. Uh, again, it's the hardiest of them all, Zone 5, which is considerably hardier. Now understand something about these. They, they will not get through the winter as look, looking like this, okay? Um, but they will be able to come up new every year, just like I explained to you. Again, you want well-drained. Uh, organic. So even though they need a lot of water, they don't like sitting in water. So uh, you don't want a marshy area for these. It needs to be well drained, but you're going to have to give them water, especially in the heat of the summer. They will do great in full sun. Uh, they will grow somewhat in shade, but they love full sun. They've been known to grow as far north as Ontario, Canada. I imagine they do a little more mitigation up there than we have to here, but uh, they've been known to grow up there. Okay. Uh, here's another example of some that can really take off for you. There's another hardy banana called the Darjeeling banana, Musa sicamensis. Okay, it's called a snow banana, and it's good from zone five to six as well. I uh, will do all right in light shade. It is native to the Himalayas, um, but I, what I like is it's got this ruby red coloring on the vein. And now let, let me show you this picture. Even you can buy them with even the striping on them. Very exotic looking. 
Uh, again, another hearty like uh, the Musa Baju or the Baju Banana. Um, and I would imagine it would have the same requirements. Uh, and I'm sure that if you uh, didn't do anything to it, let it die back, it would come uh, back pretty new from the ground. Okay. Uh, just another tropical plant. Uh, this one actually, uh, zone six is good to zone six. Uh, Tetrapanix, Papyriferus, rice paper plant. Some of you have known about this. I know some master gardeners have grown this. Uh, does need protection from the hard sun and hard freezes. But look, I mean, look at these leaves on that. You tell me they're very dramatic and very uh, exotic looking. So it's another one of those tropical plants that you might want to try. I have not tried this one, but I'm anxious to try it here in Virginia. I've covered a, a many of the tropical plants that uh, you might be able to try out here. This next plant, though, um, I'm really going to, uh, is actually my absolute favorite plant. It is very tropical, does need some work, and I'll, I'll tell you some stories about it, but some very nice slides on it. So this is my absolute favorite plant of all times, Bergmansia. Okay, now you might not be familiar with that term, that's the botanical name, the, the genus name of it, uh, but it's otherwise known as angel trumpet. Okay, it's an absolutely gorgeous plant, but it's not why I grow it. It is the most fragrant plant you've ever come across, and this is a picture of it. Okay, it's in the genus Solanaceae. That's some of you that might not know that. That's in the tomato uh, uh, family. Okay, and uh, the, because of that, the leaves can be somewhat uh, poisonous. So if you have a dog that likes to eat foliage or kids, you may not want to put this in your house or grow it around. I had a dog and I had kids and they stayed away from it. But I absolutely love this plant. Uh, this will not survive our winters if you just let it go. You're going to have to do a little bit with it. But it is, gosh, it is so beautiful and so fragrant. I'm telling you, now the interesting thing about this plant is the fragrance doesn't come out until evening. So when it's blooming like this, usually it's pretty light, like like cockbrook, 7.30, 8 o'clock, you start getting this fragrance that's absolutely intoxicating. It's not too sweet, but it's absolutely beautiful fragrance. What I do, I have several of these growing in my backyard in pots and in the ground, and I will take the flowers, uh, uh, cut three or four of them, put them in a bud vase, bring them in, and it fills the whole house with that fragrance all evening long. But it only blooms at night. So what does that tell you if it only blooms at night? What's the pollinator for this, do you think? Yeah, if you said moths, you're right. This In its native uh, range, it is pollinated by moths, which are attracted to that fragrance in the evening. Here are some various uh, cultivars of it, uh, or even species. Uh, I have the uh, Brugmansia candida, and that starts off white. When you cut it, it stays white. They don't last long in, in water, maybe a day, and they get limp, but they'll still put off the fragrance. Um, but then they get tinged around the edges with a salmon or a coral color to it uh, after you cut them, or after a day or so, and absolutely gorgeous. I also have the Brugmansia aria, which is yellow, which also changes with a sort of a salmon or color around the edges of, of that trumpet. Um, I have not grown the Salvelions or the uh, sanguine, Sanguinea with the red one. And the reason I usually haven't gotten into all those various colors is, again, I grow for the fragrance more than for the looks of it. And when they start doing, doing work with trying to get other colors, sometimes the fragrance uh, uh, of them lacks uh, on some of them. But they're absolute beautiful plant. But these, these are not for the Mika heart or the, uh, those that don't want to spend some time with the plant. They can be very time consuming, uh, but they are certainly rewarding and worth it. All right. They are, as I said, they are very tender tropical. You can see in the picture that was after a hard frost. And not only will the leaves fall off, but that whole stem there, that grew all summer there, um, will die back. All right. So I do a couple ways to, to overwinter them. Uh, the, the tried and the best is to take rooted cuttings. Before it gets to that point where you see the uh, uh, stems uh, just there in the, in the ground that's in my backyard, um, I will take cuttings from them. Uh, and these are very easy to root. Uh, you can put them in water and make sure you change the water every week because it will get uh, uh, algae in it and, and other stuff and it can get mushy. 
but uh, change the water every week. I might put a little wean hormone in there, and within in like three or four weeks, you'll have a very extensive root system. Then I pot them up, and you can see them potted in rows. That's at my office in a northern facing window, and they grew all winter like that. And so they get very nice and strong and healthy. Those are in four inch pots. Then I could take them and repot them in the, in the uh, spring, grow them all summer, and do the same thing with them. Okay, uh, for the next year, uh, they will grow pretty fast once they get established, and they will give you plenty of flowers. The only thing I, I the other thing I like to say about uh, these, uh, I do try to overwinter the one you saw that I had here outside. Um, what I'll do is, usually even before it gets to a hard frost, I will cut all those stems back to a, a stump. And I used to, what I used to do then is get some leaves and some pine balls to make sure that uh, it still stays fluffy all winter. I put about four or five inches over that spread it out up over like a mound over that stub that I cut back to. I put some plastic over it, put some rocks and bricks around it to keep it dry. And the next year, I take that off in March. And it takes a while, but usually you'll see a little green thing come up and it'll start growing again. Uh, I have a friend who was a master gardener who, uh, believe it or not, was a more la little lazier than I am when it comes to gardening. Didn't want to take all that effort. I gave him some Brugmansias. He grew them outside. Wanted to overwinter them like I do, but he didn't want to take all the time to put the mulch in the leaves and cover it with plastic. So he just got a large uh, uh, flower pot, filled it full of uh, topsoil and uh, compost, and flipped it right over top of the. <laughs> and it worked quite quite well. So that's what I do now. I just cut it back and I put a, a, an a upside down pot full of uh, uh, soil and compost in it, and it gets through quite nicely. Now, one thing I want to say about Brugmansia is that uh, I was looking in a catalog uh, about a year or so ago, looking at some new ones, and I noticed in the catalog it said that these are hardy to zone 6 or zone 5. And I know better. I grow them every year. Okay, so I called, actually called the, the nursery, the grower, and I says, why are you advertising these as hardy? Well, they are hardy. I says, I'm here in Virginia, and they die back every year. Well, they said it's not the, the, the top part, it's the root system that's hardy. I said, eh, that's, that's a little misleading, don't you think? When people read hardy, they think the whole plant is hardy. And indeed, you're right. Uh, if you protect the roots, we can get them through the winter out here. But they are very tender plants. They are strictly a tropical plant. So you're going to have to either take cuttings and bring them inside and grow new every year, or cover them, cut them back and cover them. Uh, but certainly, when you see the, the flowers that they produce and the fragrance they produce, they are so uh, worth it. Well, that's all I have today. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit, and uh, I hope that uh, you might just try to expand your gardening a little bit and try some of these tropicals. I'm sure you'll be greatly rewarded for it. Thank you.